Black Africa. The Africa of the war drum. The Africa of the ritual dance. The Africa of the war canoe. And of the witch doctor. This is the only Africa most people know. But it's an Africa which is disappearing over the horizons of history. New buildings everywhere. Mud huts and native cooking pots smoking behind the modern houses and flats. Skyscrapers shooting up out of the bush. Modern liners edging out the old picturesque fishing boats. Everywhere, change. This day will never be forgotten. The 6th of March 1957, when the Gold Coast successfully get your independence officially. Ghana. Ghana is the name. Ghana. We wish to proclaim we will be jolly, merry and gay. The 6th of March, Independence Day. International smugglers have used Hong Kong's duty-free port to make fortunes out of human suffering. So serious has the problem of narcotics become that the Hong Kong government has launched an all-out attack on the smuggler and the drug peddler. New, fast launches have been built at a cost of £60,000 each, but that's a small price to pay compared with the human suffering that's caused by the drug smuggler. With speeds of over 20 knots, the new launches can outrun almost anything and it's getting more difficult every day for the smuggler. The smuggler is always thinking up new ways to conceal his illicit cargo. An ordinary piece of board may seem innocent enough, but cunningly hidden inside it is heroin. One of these tiny packets is a weak supply for an addict, and it would cost him most of his wages. Many of the victims of this deadly trade are found by accident. A policeman on routine duty questions a man on a street corner. His answers are evasive and the policeman arrests him. This has become an almost everyday occurrence. At the police station, the man is searched. Hidden in his clothes is a packet of heroin. That's enough to set the wheels in motion. He's charged with illegal possession of drugs and confirmed as a drug addict. When new prisoners arrive at Thai Lam, they have already been in custody for 10 days without drugs, and for most of them, the worst is over. Nearly all of them are men, and most of them take heroin, which is derived from opium. They call it chasing the dragon. Lack of housing, unemployment, and poverty often drive many people to seek relief in forgetfulness. Instead, they find only more misery. Thai Lam prison can accommodate 700 men, and it's always full. But the routine is more like that of a hospital than a prison. The men are treated more as patients than prisoners, and the aim is to mend broken lives. These men are building a cinema. They've already built a swimming pool. In fact, the more they work, the less like a prison Thai lamb becomes. And there are no bars to spoil the picture either. A short time ago, these men had lost all hope. Today, many of them are learning a trade which will get them a living when they leave Thai lamb. They've made flower gardens and green lawns, and now Thai Lam doesn't even look like a prison. For those who leave Thai Lam, 
there is a second chance, and most of them will take it. From the earliest days of civilization, men, women and children have taken refuge from fear, suppression, hunger and want. Here outside Karachi, the largest city in Pakistan, tens of thousands of people still live in appalling conditions. They are the victims of partition. Most of these people are Muslims. They fled from religious conflict which broke out in India. But they found little comfort in the newly created Pakistan. The government had little time for refugees. In 1958, a peaceful revolution took place in Pakistan and a new leader emerged, General Mohammed Ayub Khan, who welcomed the Queen on her state visit to Pakistan. One of the first jobs the new government began to tackle was the refugee problem. In 1959, a new town took shape at Kurangi on the outskirts of Karachi. Within the first six months, 75,000 of the refugees had already been housed. By the time the town is finished, there'll be homes for five million more. But the problem of housing the refugees was only the start. With the modernization of Pakistan's factories, more and more people are finding employment. Many of the people of Karangi are employed in the local textile mills. Pakistan has always produced cotton as one of its major exports, but independence brought a serious problem to the industry. For while the cotton was grown in Pakistan, the mills remained in India. Today, within an industrial framework begun in the days of British rule, modern mills are being built all over the country. The cottage industry has been encouraged and men, who until a short time ago sat in village streets with nothing to do, are turning their hands to new crafts that will sell in the tourist shops in the nearby cities. There's a new life for the women of Pakistan too. After centuries of veiling themselves against the outside world, they've become wage earners. It puts them on a level for the first time in their history with the men. But for their children, it's the beginning of a new era. And they begin like children all over the world by learning to read and write. These are the citizens of tomorrow. They will have their place in the new Pakistan, which, with a background of 3,000 years of civilization, is shaping a new destiny for millions. day at Kormaksa, where the busiest air base in the RAF was even busier than usual as 50,000 people of all nationalities crowded in to see a flying display. Mohammed Ahmed Ali has been a sweeper at the air base since it opened. So his retirement brings him many congratulations, a pile of presents, and a long service gratuity of 150 pounds. Aden was a major port in the time of the Queen of Sheba. Legend has it that Noah's Ark was built here, and that Adam's son, Cain, who murdered his brother Abel, is buried here. Life in these villages has changed little since Old Testament days. Progress in agriculture has been slow. Implements and methods are age old. But now, the villages in the protectorate, helped by British advisers and money, are beginning to irrigate large areas, making possible the growing of tomatoes, bananas, cabbages and cotton. 
Britain's given advice and money for building schools and setting up medical clinics. This clinic is run by British trained Arabs with British army doctors on call as specialists. The Crown Colony of Aden consists of 75 square miles of black volcanic rock. A hundred years ago, Aden had declined to a fishing village of a mere 500 people. Today, it's the home of some 200,000 people and one of the world's busiest harbours, visited by over 500 ships a month. Because of its harbour, Aden has become GHQ Middle East, where for the first time in peacetime, Britain's three services are under a single commander-in-chief. While Suez controls the entrance to the Red Sea from the Mediterranean, Aden dominates the entrance to the Indian Ocean. Frontier disputes with the neighbouring kingdom of Yemen have been frequent, and relations have at times been strained. Some 30 sultanates, sheikdoms and other tribal units have treaties with Britain, relying on her for their defence. Recently, 11 states of the western part of the protectorate joined together to form the Federation of South Arabia. Local young men are so keen to join the Federal Army that 10 volunteers come forward for every recruit accepted. Units of British troops and Marines support the Federal Army, which is paid for out of funds provided by Britain. This proud and peaceful mingling of races, customs and religions reflects credit on generations of Britons and Arabs alike. Protected Sarawak finds its internal peace threatened by bands of armed terrorists who come across the border from Indonesian Borneo. By raiding villages and committing sabotage, Indonesia is trying to create an impression of internal unrest in Sarawak, and so throwing doubt in the eyes of the world on the freely elected structure of the Federation of Malaysia. As a member of the Commonwealth, Malaysia asked Britain for military help. Britain's Marines are protecting 80 miles of Sarawak's 600 mile frontier. At this post, 20 yards from the border, Marine Lieutenant Ashdown has local forces as well as Marines under his command. The local Dayaks, a proud race who live off the rivers and jungle of the interior, give every help to the security forces. 50 years ago, Dayaks were unrepentant headhunters. Today, Dayak officers are found in Sarawak's forces, and in the government they hold jobs from ministerial level downwards. This Kampong headman reported strangers in the district. Soon after leaving the village, the marine patrol comes across a derelict hut. No risk can be taken. In this sort of warfare, the man who acts first has the greatest chance of staying alive. Two strangers are found, resting up for the day and obviously travelling by night. Possession of illegal arms found in the hut will mean a stiff prison sentence for the two men. From Singapore to Labuan in the north and to Kuching in the south, daily air and sea transports have brought the bulk of service stores to Borneo. Food supplies, 450 tons a month, are specially created for delivery upcountry. Eggs by the hundreds of thousands and even live chickens. Most of the supply deliveries to the interior of Borneo are made by the Royal Air Force. Fuel, food, ammunition are packed fitted with parachutes, and the one-ton loads fly out. And another 20 tons of stores have landed safely at an upcountry dispersal point. But this is only one more stage in the delivery of supplies to the men, like this Gurkha patrol, who've been policing this wild terrain. Three or four days out on patrol in the jungle, they would stop at villages to check if any strangers have been reported in the area. And in most villages, 
some local supplies made the diet of these patrolmen a little less monotonous. The Royal Navy's policing duties in Borneo have included checking and searching local craft along 1,300 miles of coastline. So to break the monotony of this continual patrol work, each ship is delegated to a help the locals job ashore. The destroyer HMS Cambrian is to build a community centre for the hundred odd people who live on a remote island. So 14 of the crew, with plenty of stores, are put ashore for a week while the destroyer goes back on patrol. And when it comes to dinner time, there's plenty for everyone. The helicopters of the Royal Air Force find time to go out on a steady mercy patrol, ready to lend a hand to the sick while still remaining alerted for any outbreak of serious trouble. In this way, they help a local civilian doctor who comes from London and is employed by the Malayan government. He's flown off to his cases just as normally as a family doctor would drive off to see his patients back home in Britain. He takes three days or more on his monthly tour of the small police posts up country, putting down at tiny clearings on airstrips built out of palm branches by the tribesmen. The doctor does a job that covers a parish almost the size of England. It's big and it's hard work. He brings cure and hygiene and even education to the simple peoples of the hot steaming jungle country. They learn the facts of modern health from his regular lecture. He banks their money for them. He's even their dentist. Now that they trust him, their thanks make up for his bumpy ride getting down through the thermal currents of the tropics. This is a part of the world where nature is rich and living is simple, where life luxuriates in the moist jungle heat. Now, with the signing of a peace treaty between Malaysia and Indonesia, one of the most remarkable supply operations ever organized by British forces is coming to an end, with Indonesia abandoning confrontation against Malaysia. Something like 1,500 volunteers go out from Britain every year to 12 months of adventure and hard work in the new countries of three continents. Why do they do it? Not for the money, since the majority work only for a living allowance. Partly for experience, of course, but mainly because they want to help. Here at Dar es Salaam, the capital of Tanzania on the African coast of the Indian Ocean, is a clinic that's really helping youngsters who need help badly. Bridget Tilly comes from Hampshire. She is 26, an occupational therapist, and her sole job is looking after crippled children. There's no spare wealth to throw about in this part of the world, but there's the other sort of wealth, provided by the devotion of nurses like Bridget. She even made lots of the equipment for these children herself, and her treatment represents their main chance of getting any sort of break in life. Working for the African, working with the African. David Craze is a senior practical instructor in forestry. He comes from Limington, and he volunteered to work for the Forestry Commission of Tanzania. Miles to the west of the mountain forest is the village of Katiti, surrounded by what could be excellent farmland. This poses a man-sized job for Jim Baxter, who is helping the Africans to win wheat from an area through which great herds of elephants trumpet their way on their annual migration. In the thickly crowded places that are catching up with the modern world, the volunteers are also doing valuable work. In places like Mauritius, no luxury hotels for the nurses out from Britain. They live in the villages. They become absorbed in the local life. Judy and Jenny run a village welfare centre. These are not easy communities with Pakistani, Creole, Indian and even Chinese all keeping pointedly separate. But the volunteers can help the villagers to become good Mauritians. Volunteers from Britain, volunteers from inside Mauritius itself. Here they go side by side in their rounds of the sick and the feeble. Mauritius is a wind-swept island. One great storm in 1962 did so much damage, the work of rebuilding still goes on. 
In this, the volunteers also play their part. After that, they'll be dancing all round, and the work of another week in the sun will be finished. Ascension Island. Every few months, families fly off from London Airport to live and work 4,000 miles away in this island, which is one of Britain's remotest possessions. Alan Manylaws from Brightlingsea, Essex, has just arrived with his family, while the Greys from Reading, after a 15-month term, are packing up to go home. Jim is a BBC electronics engineer, for the importance of the island is that it's a link in the world network of BBC broadcasts and the cable and wireless services. The towering masts and aerials pick up the BBC broadcasts from London for a relay to South America and Africa. BBC World Service. A few miles away is Georgetown. And this, it's a shop. The only one on an island miles from anywhere. A shop where choice is limited, where fashion fights a losing battle, where the women folk consider themselves lucky to buy even one brand of lipstick. Dominating the Ascension Island scenery today is a huge dish aerial set up by Britain as part of the global communication system for the Apollo Man on the Moon project. It'll record the first American moon landing. And in an island that has come to be called Moon Country, it seems to be in the right place. Only those over 40 can now have adult memories of life under the British Raj. Permanent structures remain, such as the Gateway of India in Bombay, built to commemorate the visit of King George V and Queen Mary in 1911. India Gate, Delhi, and King George gazes down the long Raj path, a tourist attraction like the snake charmers gathered at his feet. The most enduring monument is New Delhi itself, of breathtaking grandeur, as though the British Empire had seen the night approaching and made one last proud imperial gesture while it was yet light. But other things remain, like cricket, significant not of domination, but of the ties of friendship. The army of the world's largest democracy is trained and equipped along British lines. Although technically foreigners now, the British feel at home in India. The ties are practical enough. Here, a group of British doctors, members of the International Cultural Exchange, are greeted by their Indian colleagues, with whom they'll study ways and means of further cooperation. On the industrial front, production has gone up by 160% in 15 years. Indian engineers here overhauling jet engines, scientists and technologists have proved themselves among the world's best. They built great dams, atomic power stations, factories by the score, and mechanization is coming slowly to the land. India has her fair share of unrest, which tends to obscure the peaceful workings of a very real democracy. This is a century of revolution. Politics, economics, science, education, the arts, all in the throes of a radical upheaval. In this struggle, men of all faiths are today abandoning their old bitter rivalries, turning friendly and inquiring eyes to each other. A revolution indeed. Prime Minister of India is a woman, Indira Gandhi. Something of a political compromise brought her to office, 
but since then she has gained worldwide admiration for hard and honest work for her country and the causes of peace. Her country is great in tradition, rich in beauty, with an astonishing depth of religious life, with a huge capacity for hard work and an inexhaustible supply of labor, the Indian people are well equipped for the Herculean tasks ahead. The first 21 years have given ample proof of that.